and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from October 1985. I try to compare the masses of Frogger clones. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, Pay a visit to Type in Corner, give you some playing tips, and end with my demo of the month. It's a big episode, but first, it's the news. Sinclair are trying to play down the Spanish release of their new Micro, but users are buying for more details. There is still no firm release date for the UK, but at least some information is filtering through. The machine will have a QL style keyboard and an extended keyboard holding cursor keys. It will, as expected, have 128K of memory that are bank switched 16K blocks. It will also have an RS232 interface, similar to that of Interface 1. The Spanish model is said not to have an AY chip, but sound can be output via the television or monitor. The rumoured UK version, however, will include an AY chip, which is good news for UK fans. Despite its problems, Sinclair came out top in an independent audit of market share. The research done by Audit of Great Britain gives Sinclair 56.8% of the market and includes all models, even the QL, in those figures. Even with this information, Sinclair remain adamant that the 128K machine will not be launched in the UK this year. DeMarc are set to publish what it calls a computer nasty. The game will be based on the successful Friday the 13th movies but to Mark say they will not overstep the mark. The game involves staying alive, no surprises there then, and saving as many people as possible. The game will be released for the Spectrum next month. Sinclair's portable computer, according to the company, will definitely be appearing next year. Codenamed Pandora, the machine will be based on the QL rather than the Spectrum, and will use the 68000 processor. The target release date is April. Sir Clive, though, had to re-evaluate this date after the problems earlier this year, but this and the £50 million wafer project are still going ahead. It's not all good news for Sinclair, as the receivers have been called in to the troubled electronic vehicles company that produced the Sinclair C5. After nine months of poor sales and criticism, the company, newly renamed TPD, have debts of over £700,000 to 110 different suppliers. It is hoped a buyer can be found for the company so that production of the C10 and C15 vehicles, which are said to be in advanced stages, can continue. Matthew Smith has written the third instalment of the Minor Willy games and it is due for release in January. The game, named Minor Willy Meets the Taxman, is said to have a different graphic style than the previous outings, with what Paul Patterson, the sales manager of Software Project, calls larger pictures. He certainly knows a thing or two about computer games then. And now on to the top selling games. New into the chart this month comes Daily Thompson's Super Test from Ocean Software. Frankie Goes to Hollywood from Ocean Software. Fighting Warrior from Melbourne House. Board of the Rings. The parody adventure game from Silversoft. And Marsport from Gargoyle Games. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from October 1985. Frogger in the Arcade was released in 1981 developed by Konami and released by Sega, and was a refreshing change from the multitude of alien shooting machines flooding the arcades. The idea, as with many early arcade games, was simple. Guide your frog to his home at the top of the screen in a given time limit. To get there though, he had to negotiate busy roads, a path, and finally a river. And this is where we meet the world's only frog that dies when it comes into contact with water. As the levels progress, the road gets busier, and the river becomes more treacherous, with added crocodiles. For this shootout, I had to be very strict due to the number of clones on the spectrum. After trawling the archives, I had over 20 versions, even after throwing out type-ins and tape magazine games in 3D incarnations. 
I wanted to cover just commercial releases too, but there are some good freeware titles that I had to include, just because they're worth mentioning. Right, on to the first game. This is Frogger from ANF Software, released in 1983. The screen layout looks good, but as soon as the game begins, we get a jerk fest of movement. Most of the arcade elements are present, including the extra points for eating bugs on logs, but the response to control is very sluggish, making this version difficult to master. Sound is used well, especially the ribbit sound of the frog. There are crocodiles too, but they don't replace the logs like the arcade, they just appear randomly as a last obstacle to avoid. There's also a lack of turtles that dive underwater. It looks better than it plays, and the blocky movement ruins but otherwise could have been a great game. Next we have Frogger from Astro Software, released in 1983. This is a commercial program written in BASIC, and it suffers from the usual problems. Small jerky graphics, poor sound, poor control, and poor gameplay. One to forget, I think. Next we have Frogger from SeaTech, released in 1982. This splits the game into two sections. First the road, which has cartoon-like cars and gets busier as the levels progress. Complete this and it's onto the river with logs and turtles, although the turtles don't seem to dive. The graphics are large, but again we have jerky movement which spoils things. Control is more responsive than the previous games, so at least it's a little bit more playable. Sound is limited to beeps, but there's a nice little tune that plays. The time to move between levels is very long, and I thought my game had crashed at first. Sometimes you have to wait over 20 seconds. Not a good clone, but so far, the best for playability, which is a sad thing to say about a C-Tech game. Next we have Frogger from Denisoft, released in 2009. This is a much more modern game, released outside of the Spectrum's life. The gameplay is the same, but moves away from the arcade graphic-wise. We have larger graphics, packed into a smaller playing area. The graphics are well drawn and move very smoothly, if a little fast, especially for the first level. Control is very responsive, but because the frog doesn't hop in blocks, lining him up with the spaces proves tricky. The logs in the river are particularly difficult to judge, as the frog's position is not fixed and he can move around on the log, making the final leap awkward. Sound is used minimally, and I can't help thinking this could have been the king of froggers had the logs been larger, earlier gameplay a little bit easier, and the movement of the frog in jumps. But never mind, not a bad game. Next we have Frogger from Rabbit Software, released in 1983. The screen layout is changed from the arcade by adding a kind of maze between the road and the river, but other than that it's familiar territory. The cars move smoothly, but our frog can move quicker than the slowest cars, meaning he can often jump into them and die. The road is a bit cluttered too, making it hard to get across, and it took me a long time to do it. The maze, as mentioned before, adds a little more danger, as colliding with the walls will kill your frog, an unnecessary addition in my opinion. The river is void of turtles, and the logs are large enough not to cause too many problems. Control is okay, with the frog responding to the keys sharply, but the sound does get a little grating, especially after each life as the timer refills. Another below par version I'm afraid. On to the next one. And this is Froggy from DLJ Software, released in 1983. Wow, now this is a good version of the arcade game. The graphics are a little small, but move well. They're not smooth, but they suit the game and work really well with the game mechanics, which is very important. The road is not too difficult at first, making the game more approachable. The river includes turtles that dive, which adds more peril to the journey, and we get a nice frog when he makes it home. There are a few nice tunes that play, and the sound effects, although minimal, suit the game. Playability is spot on, 
letting you get far enough that you want to keep going back and trying again. The crocodiles do appear, but unlike the arcade, they just pop up randomly in the space your frog has to get to. Certainly the best game so far. Next we have Frog Hopper from Walton Software. This is one of those games that, for some reason, tries to impress by throwing various annoying techniques at you rather than letting you get on with the game. Yes, the sounds are impressive the first time, but it soon gets annoying, as you'll find out. When you finally get to the game, the graphics are very large and move very smoothly. And if anything, they're too large. Your frog also moves along slowly and can actually cross halfway between the different layers of obstacles. This means that it's all too easy to get trapped, especially when the controls are a little unresponsive. This happens all too frequently, and means you have to sit through the tech demo before having another go. This spoils the game, and it's certainly not one I'd go back to. Next we have Frog Run from Anirog Software, released in 1984. The screen, as you can see, is white. Why on earth could they do that? Anyway, on with the gameplay. And despite what it looks like, it plays quite well, and certainly better than some of the previous games. The graphics are large, but poorly drawn, and move in 8 pixel leaps. The turtles in the river don't dive, which is a bit of a running issue, it seems. Difficulty is about right, meaning you can progress, and response to control is usually fine. I say usually because sometimes it can be over-responsive, and you have to make sure that you don't hold down the key too long. Sound is limited to beeps, which is fine, I suppose. So, despite the obvious problems, it plays quite nicely if you can get over the bland graphics and white screen. Next we have Gribbit, from Alternative Software, released in 1990. This game looks really nice. The graphics are large and well drawn and move really smoothly. The frog, although looking a bit odd, moves in jumps, which is ideal and makes gameplay so much better. The vehicles move slowly enough to allow you to cross the road, and the logs and turtles prove easy enough to navigate. The hardest part is getting to the final home. You have to be within a few pixels to get it right, and this can be tricky until you get the hang of it. The far left space is very hard to get, as the logs and turtles don't always line up, and you find yourself jumping around quite a bit. Luckily the turtles don't dive, and there are no crocodiles, so this is made a little easier. The one big problem with this game is the time limit. There isn't one, which means it's less frantic action, and you can take as long as you want. Sound is a bit minimal, with just jumping and death sounds, but again that suits the game. Not a bad attempt this, and certainly playable, although the lack of a timer does detract slightly, as there's just no urgency to it. Next we have Hopper from PSS, released in 1983. On first glance, this looks to be a very busy screen with lots of obstacles to get past, and it does prove very tricky to actually make progress for a number of reasons. The movement of the frog is very odd. He can move smoothly left and right, but he jumps forward in bounds. This is a bit strange, especially when playing. The traffic on the road is also weird. There are three lanes moving left and three lanes moving right. Trying to navigate this is tricky, as the gaps don't present themselves as they would if the lanes were alternating. The relative safety of the path is also made harder by the inclusion of a train for some reason. The river includes logs and turtles, although they don't dive. The white things in between are not things to jump on, as I found out, nor are they there to be avoided, so I don't really know what they're there for. All of this makes playability difficult. The graphics are basic, but move smoothly enough, and sound is minimal. Control is a bit too keen, meaning you can often jump twice, which usually leads to instant death. Luckily though, there is no timer, but even that doesn't save this game.
And now on to Jogger, by Seven Software, released in 1984. This game gives us a different take on Frogger, replacing the frog with a jogger. The premise is the same though, although things play differently. The rivers can be crossed, the same as roads, and all you have to do is avoid ships and crocodiles. This can be a little disconcerting, especially having played the numerous Frogger clones for the last five or six hours. The game is pretty basic, with small jerky graphics, bad sound and dodgy controls. You could probably find better typing games in magazines to be honest, so let's move along. Next we have Leapfrog from CDS, released in 1983. Back to the familiar screen layout, but with some very basic looking graphics. There's the usual road, path and river, but the cars and lorries and diggers look pretty poor. The logs are just solid blocks of colour, and the turtles are reduced to oval blobs, but they do dive. Well, they sort of vanish and change colour. Everything moves in character jumps, but with the same movement for the frog, it's quite easy to play. Response is good, sometimes, like many other games, a little bit too keen at times. There's also a lack of urgency about this game because it's missing the timer, so you can take as long as you want to finish the game. Further levels increase the speed and number of traffic, and reduce the turtles from three ovals to two. A fairly average game then. Moving along. And next we have Mouse, released by WB Software in 1983. This is a very busy screen, and the gameplay reminds me of Jogger. There's no river, just layers of things to avoid, so the gameplay does suffer. The movement isn't exactly smooth, but there's just too much on screen. The frog is replaced by a flickering mouse, but the principle is the same. Sound is basic, and the gameplay soon becomes boring. Let's move on. Next we have Road Frog from Spectrum Games, released in 1983. For some reason this game chooses to draw the road in white, but aside from that we get the usual layout. The graphics are large and move smoothly, but the frog does look a little odd. More like a spaceship, really. There are no turtles in the river either, just logs, so an omission there. The frog movement is in character squares, which helps navigation, and playability isn't too bad. The sound consists of a continuous hiss. I think it's meant to be the traffic, but it does stop to play a dull tune when you reach the end. Control is hit and miss. Sometimes reacting straight away, other times not at all. This obviously causes issues and detracts from the gameplay. There's also no timer, so you can hang about as long as you like. A pretty average attempt then. On to the next one and Road Toad from Elfin Software, released in 1983. This game was quickly picked up by DKtronics and sold under their own label. The graphics are large, well drawn and smooth, with the frog jumping in leaps as expected. The road is a little too cluttered though, making it difficult to progress. The river has logs and turtles that dive, so we get the added hazard. Gameplay is average due to the controls that can sometimes feel sticky, and this leads to our frog being squashed by a lorry or jumping into the river. Sound consists of a few zaps when our frog gets killed, but little else. There is a timer, so you can't hang about, and the busy road does prove a little too tricky at times, meaning you can often lose interest within a few plays. Not a bad game, but not one that stands out. Next we have Terry's Travels by Al Grey Software, released in 1983. Here our frog has been replaced by a turtle that is trying to get back home. The game has some nice speech, but once we get into the game, it all goes a bit wrong. There are lines of smooth moving traffic and logs, but the difficulty is just too high. Movement and navigation is awkward, despite the controls being responsive. But in the end it just gets too frustrating to play. There's no timer either, so no real urgency, just endless rounds of dying quickly. Let's move along. 
And finally, yes, we've reached the end. The last game is Yomp by Virgin Games, released in 1983. Was this really a commercial release by Virgin? The format has been changed slightly and the frog replaced by a soldier. There's no river, just lines of traffic. The instructions claim that there's a further section if you get three men across the road, but I never managed it. The graphics are poorly drawn and moving character jumps, making the whole thing look terrible. And it reminds me of a typing game from a magazine. Gameplay is far too difficult, mainly due to the controls being hit and miss. There's also no option to jump backwards, so your only choice is forwards, and with the limited space between the lorries, you just keep dying. All in all, a poor offering from Virgin. That's it, we've reached the end of our Marathon Frogger session, which took me ages to put together and involved quite a lot of alcohol. So, which of the many versions came out on top? There's no competition really. Froggy by DLJ is the king of froggers for me. Especially if you are looking for an arcade clone that gets as close as possible. It looks good, it plays well, and it does everything right. Okay, I think I'll go and have a little lie down now. This is Astronaut, released by Software Projects in 1984. It seems a space freighter has been hit by asteroids, scattering its cargo of resource blocks across the planet's surface. And it's your job to collect the blocks and gather them together on the transporter pad, ready to be collected. The planet, though, is unexplored, and you have no idea what's out there. Each screen consists of various platforms, vanishing walkways, volcanoes, and some nasty aliens. There are three blocks to collect per screen, and you do this by pushing them left and right so they drop down, eventually reaching the flashing transporter pad at the bottom of the screen. You can get to the top of the screen again by climbing ladders or using the volcanoes to blast you upwards. Choosing the correct route is the key, so you have to time your moves carefully. Each level is different and has another set of aliens to avoid. If this game looks familiar, it's because it's by the same author as Thruster, and shares quite a lot of the gameplay. The graphics are large, colourful, and well animated, and control is very responsive. The sound consists of a Thruster-like warble that plays continuously, and a bleep when a block is placed on the transporter, but that's about it. The aliens can be killed by using bombs. Dropping these gives you enough time to move away before they explode, but these are pretty useless, because the alien soon reappears again afterwards. If you lose a life, all of the blocks that you've previously collected are reset, and you have to start again, which is a bit harsh, really. I found the best plan was to locate a safe area on screen where you don't get killed, and then watch the movement patterns of the aliens so you can plan your route. Gameplay-wise, it's very much like Thruster, but I don't think it's quite as good. Each level has a time limit too, so you can't hang about. There's plenty of variety in the levels, but some I found to be very frustrating, and before you knew it you got killed, and this leads to frustration. A nice feature though is that the game allows you to start on any level, so at least if you get stuck on any particular screen, you can try another one. Not a bad game then, but I still prefer Thruster. This is Fighting Warrior, released by Melbourne House in 1985. An Egyptian princess has been kidnapped by an evil pharaoh, and as the country's most acclaimed warrior, it's your task to rescue her. To do this you have to march across the desert and fight anything that gets in your way. So it's a scrolling beat-em-up. The graphics are really nice, and the characters are well animated. Your warrior can strike high, middle or low with his sword, and avoid arrows at the same time by either jumping or crouching down. As you progress, enemies appear at the left, walk towards you, and a fight ensues. As each enemy is killed, a vase will appear. Destroying these will produce one of five effects. These range from killing the next enemy straight away, giving you more stamina, or removing the enemy's stamina each time they hit you. Discovering the order in which they appear is key to this game, and tips can be found on various internet sites. Fighting-wise, the best tactic is to keep hitting in the middle, 
This is because the upper and lower blows take longer to execute, meaning your enemy has more time to hit back. It's also not worth trying to avoid the arrows during a fight, as again it takes a long time to crouch down or jump, and the enemy will just keep hitting you. As you fight, your stamina and the enemy's stamina can be seen at the bottom of the screen, and these lower each time a blow is landed. Once you win the fight, your health is restored, and you can march onward. Once you get over the nice visuals, the game soon becomes a little bit boring. The landscape moves along, but it's just so repetitive. You kill something, pick up a jar if it's a good one, walk a bit, repeat. After about 17 minutes, you do make it to the princess, but I just couldn't be bothered to play that long. There was nothing there to keep me interested. Response to controls is good, but the sound is very limited, and only plays a sound when a blow is struck. I wanted more from this game, I expected more, but sadly I was let down. Yes, the graphics are nice, but there's just no playability. This is Count Ducula, a game released by Alternative Software in 1989, and it's based on the popular kids cartoon of the same era. Count Ducula and his chums, Igor and Manny, have transported themselves back to the land of the pharaohs in search of the mystical saxophone. It doesn't say why they wanted to find it other than it possesses magical powers. Strange really because I didn't think the saxophone was around in Egyptian times, but the very first episode of the cartoon on television was titled No Sax Please Wear Egyptian, the same subtitle as this game, so I guess they just used the plot from that. Back to the game and Ducula starts at the base of the pyramid and sets off to explore. Within the pyramids are doors that require keys, and these are scattered about in various rooms. There are also several objects that need collecting, to allow you to get past certain points of the game. These are a death mask, a sandbag and a hammer, and again these can be found in various rooms. The game map is pyramid shaped, which helps navigation, and the panel indicates how many keys you are carrying on the right hand side, and the objects you are carrying on the left. There's also a clock that ticks slowly up, and this moves faster if you come into contact with any of the enemies, like the mummy, the bats, the falling rocks, or one of the crow brothers that can be found climbing about. The time limit given for the quest is just 12 hours, but you can get extra time if you collect various items, or if Igor appears. If Nanny appears, apparently, she can smash down doors so you don't need a key, but I never saw her during my numerous games. As you can see, the graphics are large and nicely drawn, and move very smoothly, and the use of monochrome means that there's no colour clash, although it can sometimes be hard to see what's going on. The use of flip screen can also be problematic, especially at the top of stairs. Ducula has no weapons, so all he can do is jump over things to avoid them. So really it's just a standard arcade adventure based on a cartoon. As far as these types of games go though, it isn't too bad. I suppose it's quite short, and can be completed in around 6 minutes if you know where all the keys are. Sound is a bit of a letdown, the game plays pretty much in silence. You get the odd blip sound when you pick up a key, but that's all. Difficulty is, I would say, easy, but I suppose it was targeted at a younger audience although it does make a change for me to be able to get quite far in this type of game without running out of energy or dying. All in all, a decent, if short, arcade adventure. It's the future, and crime is running right in New York, and only one man can put an end to it. Matthew Cranston, a.k.a. Metal Man. The plot reads a little bit like Robocop, and the game follows the same format as the Robocop game, and many other run and shooters. The first thing you notice is the graphics. They're large, in fact very large, and very colourful. The author has done a great job of squeezing the spectrum until it screams. There are many missions in the game, the first one is to find a number of computer chips so that you can upload a virus to the computer. Here, as with most levels, you walk around and use the lifts to access other areas. There are of course the bad guys out there to stop you. These come in various forms, and are all very well drawn and animated. 
It's action pretty much all of the way, as you explore the areas, shooting anything that moves and trying to locate the chips. It's not an easy game, and all too often I found myself dead within a few minutes. Maybe it's because I went in all guns blazing, when I should actually be taking a more strategic approach. The controls work really well, allowing you to control lifts, crouch and fire diagonally, all with just four directions in the fire button. The backgrounds are great too, and this is a very impressive game, if a little hard. Sound and music are good with some nice effects. And there are also different things to collect like power-ups, shields and health packs. In one section you get to fly in a space scooter, and in later levels you get to operate cranes to move things about. There's just so much in this game. I spent quite a while playing, and even though I didn't get very far, I certainly enjoyed it. If you like this style of game, definitely give this a try. It's very well done and will provide a great challenge. Welcome to Type In Corner, revealing games not seen for over 20 years. This month's game is Pothole and was written by A. Boyce and appeared in a March 1983 edition of Popular Computing Weekly. The listing was small, just half a page of code, which is probably why I typed it out. The game is simple. Guide your man down the pothole, avoid the sides and rocks as you go. There's no sound unless you crash, and the simple left-right controls means it's easy to pick up. Yes, it's not the most exciting game, but this is what typings are all about and there's plenty of room for improvement and modification. This game has not been seen since it was first published, and will be available to download from my blog very shortly. Today we're going to have a look at The Lords of Midnight and a tip I picked up a few years ago while I was reading The Lords of Midnight news group. On that news group a few of the people on there were discussing how in The Lords of Midnight you can get quite far on the first day. So I booted up The Lords of Midnight and had a go and found that yeah, if you know what you're doing, you know where to go, you can actually get a long long way on the first day of The Lords of Midnight. So here we go at the start of The Lords of Midnight. First thing you want to do is change to Ecolith and move him southeast until you see some ice trolls and then go south and you'll see a row of liths. Now they're the useful liths, they've got lots of cups of dreams. So go to the first lith and seek and you'll find a cup of dreams. Then south again, ignore the first lith and the second lith that you come to, then the third lith you want to seek again and you'll find another cup of dreams. Then you want to go southwest and past the keep and to the Citadel of God. At the Citadel of God, two things you want to do. Get Carlos to seek again, that'll get him a sword wolf slayer, which is very, very useful, and recruit the Lord of God. Now, as the Lord of God, you want to go back to that row of liths. Go north, and the second lift you come to, when you seek, you will find another cup of dreams. So far, so good. Next bit gets tricky. The henge you can see in the distance, there's a cup of dreams at that. So you move to that and get that. Now you've got to get the moves exactly right for the next bit, because that's the last cup of dreams you'll find. So you go north, then northeast east and southeast, circling around the top of those mountains. Then 
south, east again, then south. That next move has to be south, because your last move of the day has to be southeast to get to the Keep of Brith and recruit Lord Brith. Lord Brith, you can then move him northeast and east towards the Keep of Mythog. You can't get Lord Mythog. I've tried it, I've tried going multiple ways, seeing what I could do, it's not possible to get Lord Mythog, but tomorrow morning Lord Brith will be able to recruit Lord Mythog, and one of them will be able to go and recruit Lord Shimmeril, and the other, probably Lord Dawn, actually, and there are some more lists that can help you out with Cups of Dreams on the way to Lord Dawn as well. There you go, that's how you can get a long, long way on the first day of the Lords of Midnight. It's time for my demo of the month, and this month it's Mission Highly Improbable, a 48k demo by Huey Program, released in 2014. This 10 minute plus demo includes some great music using the AY chip, so if you're using an emulator, make sure you've got that option enabled. the introduction of the people responsible for the demo, we get a rotating donut. This effect is quite common in demos and not one I particularly like, due to the slow frame rate. Next we get something I'm not entirely sure what to call. It's a sort of plasma with scrolling attributes, but it looks really good. followed by large scrolling images, mostly of women, and again with some great music. After more shaded scrolling, and a cheeky dig at the Commodore 64, we get a nice rotating cube, and more image manipulation, this looks really impressive. enough we then get a warp cube, which is surprising considering it's running on a 48k spectrum. This demo has some very clever techniques, and it's certainly well worth watching all the way through. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon!